This is the Dane Moore NBA podcast coming at you Monday morning. It's October 16th, uh, and I've got two guests for this episode. Uh, We'll talk about the Wolves preseason game uh, in New York against the Knicks that they won on Saturday night. And we'll kind of do that by answering five Wolves questions that I've put together, which maybe is a hint at who the surprise guest is. Timberwolves beat writer, Chris Hine. Not the surprise guest. <laughs> Not the surprise guest. <laughs> regular um, Monday guest here. Regular Monday guest, Chris Hine, who <laughs> had a wonderful suggestion that we bring on the one and only Lord <laughs> Kilby. <laughs> Thank you. Greg Kilborn, how are you? Well, it looks like we have different backgrounds. Was I supposed to be in a uh, boring white room? <laughs> hey, we're, we're still getting things started here. What, is, what the hell is going on? What is that behind you? Is that a... That's a uh, conquistador lamp, and it's very pricey. I was going to say, that might cost more than my entire apartment. So. <laughs> this is just called like downtown Minneapolis uh, boring guy yep. decor. Well, so I have my girlfriend's desk is behind me over there. We share an office space. So I've had people say to me like, oh, why don't you have stuff like up on the wall behind me? Because if I had like a picture of Kevin Garnett up there, then my girlfriend would need to be looking at Kevin Garnett five days a week, which I promise you she does not want to do. Anything is possible, by the way. Anything is possible. (laughs) Anything is possible. Um, So, okay, this was Chris's idea to have Craig back. Craig was on a couple weeks ago. Chris, explain why you and Craig have been reconnecting of late. We are both massive fans of the show Frasier. I think we think it's the best sitcom ever made. Um, It's my favorite of all time. I just rewatched the whole thing. Uh, in time for the, I guess, reboot, uh, revamping, sequel, whatever they want to term it, that just came out on on Paramount Plus uh, this past week to mixed reviews. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that a little, a little in a little bit. Um, but we we share a, a great passion for just how brilliant that that show is, and and it's one of the few shows that I can just watch over and over again. Makes me laugh. The same episodes make me laugh. It, as hard as they did when I first saw them in the same spots. Like it's, 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 it's really, I I think a magical show to me at least. So Craig, I I was explaining to Chris Uh that, so I did the same thing last summer where I rewatched all of Seinfeld and, Uh and I was just not even knowing that Chris was this huge Frasier fan Uh um, and being like, I, I was like my thing. I watched the whole off season the summer before, and and he was just to me. He's like, you got to do Frasier next. You got to do Frasier next. And I said, which I've, I mean, you know, I've seen random episodes here and there, but I've never done it uh, end to end. Do I, do I need to watch Frasier? Well, it you know when I was working, I missed a lot of these uh, sitcoms because I yeah. when I was in college, I I liked Cheers. When I was growing up, I liked mm-hmm. Jackie Gleason, The Honeymooners, but. Um, when I was working, my dad would call me and say, you got to see Seinfeld. It's hilarious. You got to see it. And I didn't, I didn't watch it because I was working. So when I worked, nope. I would only watch as an outlet, I would watch NBA games, live sporting sure. events, but I wouldn't watch sitcoms. And then I, when I left late night in 2004, I discovered uh, Frazier and it's right up my alley. I mean, he's erudite, he's white collar and, and, and uh, <clears throat> I had had these guys on my show and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't, I watch it because I would have been fawning over Jane, Jane leaves who played Daphne moon. Cause I fell in love with her, but uh, on the show, but I love Niles. I love Frazier. I love the writing, but you know, the acting he's, he went to Juilliard, uh, Kelsey Grammer. And I'm not, I, he's just a normal guy in, in real life. He's not, you know, he, he's not as funny as Ray Romano and Jerry Seinfeld, but he's, a, he's, he has a great voice. He can do, he can do some impressions. He does James Mason, all this kind of stuff. So I just went crazy and I would watch, we, my, my girlfriend and I would watch it every night before we went to bed, like two episodes. So I, it's 11 seasons. I've seen it four or five times through. However, I mentioned this to Chris, I texted, I, I, the new Frasier did not do it for me. And I, I stopped in the middle of the first episode and said, I'm done. What if you brought that mentality of the Minnesota Timberwolves, the <laughs> Minnesota I, Timberwolves I, fandom, Craig? I, you wouldn't be here right now. Well, I have it, and then I come back. You know, but, <laughs> uh, the Al Jefferson Randy Foyers took it 
to get out of me. <laughs> but no, uh, quickly, my review is I, uh, Frazier, Kelsey's great. He has a great voice. He's a great actor. Uh, I can't stand the nephew. I don't like young people in general. And um, uh, so now, as Chris said, which is true, he said the second episode gets better. Sometimes the first episode when they're setting things up, the pilot episode is not is not that great. But I was very disappointed and I had high expectations. And that doesn't sound that doesn't make sense. But my guys, my old warm up guys from my old late uh, late night show, I had coffee with them and they were they had warmed up the audience for the new Frasier uh, reboot. And they said, no, 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 nine out of the 10 episodes are good. Maybe they were talking <laughs> maybe, about the next maybe nine. the first one. Yeah. yeah, but I'm disappointed, and I'm sorry, Chris. But if I see it, I I, I don't know if I'm going to watch it now. I, I, you I'm know, I, I I feel you. I, I I went from being very very hesitant to embrace this um, to as it got closer, I got more excited for it. And as I was doing my rewatch, I just got excited for the fact that Kelsey Grammer might be irrationally getting upset on my television screen again right. like I, I was just excited at that prospect right um, i knew i knew david hyde pierce was not going to be a part of it yeah they announced that uh bb newworth and perry gilpin were at least going to make guest appearances so you have at least a little bit of the old right. guard coming back um but somebody on a, on a message board made a good point where they said like well you know if if you had described fraser after cheers and no and like nobody was a part of Frasier, you know, in 1993, when they're making that show, everybody would have been out on it immediately. Sure. It's like, why, why are we following Frasier Crane to Seattle? Mm -hmm. And this whole new cast of people, nobody from Cheers is there. You know, why would we be investing in this? So I, I, I had an open mind. I want to have yeah. an open mind with this. And I'm giving it a shot because of that. And the fact that they are seemingly trying to at least make this the next step in Fraser Crane's life. I mean, we have a 20 year gap where, right. you know, they, they, they summed up about a 20 year gap in his life in about two sentences in the, in the pilot episode. Uh, but I will say the second episode did get better. I, I share your, your uh, angst about the, the David character, uh, which is just like trying to stand in for Niles and what he brought right. to the show. Right. Um, but I will say, I thought some of the interplay between Kelsey and Freddie in episode two got, got better. Okay. Um, yeah, there were, Kelsey, there were some, there were some subtle callbacks that I thought yeah. were well done as well. Um, so, hey, so I, 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 right. I, I'm, I'm still in on it a little bit. I like, I'm the guy, I'm sure Dane's going to cut all this out. By the way. Right. <laughs> like, but yeah. This has been a uh, sitcom talk of the Dane Moore NBA podcast. Hey no. man, I, I'm, I'm about it. I want to know, like, if you ever think we are going to, uh, both of you, like, are we going to get a anything close to like the sitcom heyday we had of like 20 years ago? Like, why can't that be a popular thing in particularly today when there's I mean, think about how many terrible things we're watching, like on Netflix and all these streaming sessions. We just have it right at our fingertips. It's like it's just surprising to me that there isn't really anything that approaches the many shows in the 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, I think the because of all the streaming services, you don't have, you know, the big things on NBC like the the remake of The Office, you know, the American version of The Office. Yeah. All the young people I know, my nieces, they just love that. And I know Modern Family was really popular, right. but after mm -hmm. that, you're I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if it's set up that way. Both right. of those didn't have a laugh track or a live audience, but uh, I don't know. I I'm saying it probably won't happen because the shows that the people really Mm -hmm. grab onto or like secession and all that kind of stuff yeah or like the really stupid stuff like i watched some love is blind this weekend and <laughs> i just can't believe that's where we're at like yeah. that's <laughs> that... sorry i don't i don't know what that is I'm yeah that, <laughs> Neither, that, 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 that i actually i actually re yeah. respect you uh for that uh it was the um i, I don't know it's just it, humor has always been a subjective thing but it did seem like you know at one point you know, you're like throughout the most of television history, America, whether it was because you only had three or four channels in the sixties and seventies to, you know, a limited number of channels. It seemed like you, you, we had a collective sense of humor and now because of all cable and then the streaming, mm -hmm. everything just got fragmented and, you know, you're, you're also not forced to watch like, Oh, Seinfeld is one of the only things on sure. all in the family is one of the only things on television, the Mary Tyler Moore show. Um, which happen to be great shows, 
but those were also the only things people could watch back right. then too. So, um, all right. That was that was sitcom talk. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm all about it. I, 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 Craig and I are going to do. I, I want to ask Craig his top five Frasier episodes, but we could do that after that. No, yeah, no. Let's, 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 let's do that at the end of the episode. Let's do yeah, it at the yeah, end yeah. Of the episode. We don't have. Yeah, I mean, we'll, get, we'll let him stew on it a little bit. Yeah, we don't. We don't have that much wolf stuff to talk about. Well, we did have a game uh, on Saturday, uh, so it's interspersed some some thoughts on that. But I, I think just broadly, having watched these three games, right, like. Granted, it's preseason or whatever, but I, I don't – what more could have you really wanted, right, out of this Wolves team outside of maybe, I don't know, Ant missing a game, Jaden missing a couple of these games. Broadly, I think this has been a really encouraging first 12 quarters of uh, of Timberwolves basketball. So my, my first question, and I guess I'll direct this to you, Craig, is what in these first three preseason games has excited you most about this group for this season? Well, Cat's playing well. Um, which is great. And um, I should say prior to the preseason, I, I have a lot of optimism for the Wolves where I'm kind of privately saying, although I texted to you guys, I'm, I, I said I was picking or predicting a top four finish in the West. And I'm tweaking that to saying just to be cautious I'm hoping for a top four finish in the West. I want them to have home court in the first round. And I know the West is is uh, stacked, and I also know that it's it's fairly even. But I just felt like last year, I felt we were better than the Sacramento Kings. We always beat them. They finished third. Um, so I really watched the Knicks game hard. Um, unfortunately, I'm now... I'm at a point where now I'm picky and I'm concerned about things because I have these high expectations. Mm -hmm. And you, you, I think you said you rewatched the first half. In the second half, Rudy twice uh, had a defensive rebound in his grasp and Mitchell Robinson took it away from him twice. Yeah. And he looked slow. And my thing is, wait a second. Has he always been this slow or is he slowing down, Rudy? You know what I'm saying? Because I, I love the fact that we have a rim protector and we're good on a good on team defense. Mm -hmm. But I'm worried about, you know, what is he, 31? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about Rudy a little bit. And uh, can I give you my other concern? Yeah. Okay. Go my ahead. other and because I just want to tell you. So everyone has an issue with cat. And I think um I think he's very gifted. I loved our game five at, at Denver um, where we lost, but we were in it. Um, you know how Tim Duncan and Jokic, they just make plays to win. That's They're just thinking about winning and they think the game. I think Kat thinks about how talented he is and I can't wait to show how talented I am on offense. I, I can't, I can shoot left-handed. I can do automatic jump hooks. I can drive and I, I have a feathery three. And I don't think he thinks about the winning, the small little winning plays. And now I'm okay with that because he's so talented as long as we have a, as long as we have Mike Connolly and Jade McDaniels and Anthony Edwards and surrounding him. But that sometimes concerns me. Sure. Um, and one more thing and I'll, I'll stop, but no, is, is, um, yeah, I love Finchie. I love the, the free flowing, uh, the ball movement. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I have an issue with turnovers we had three in a row yeah, at the Knicks. Right. This is just a preseason game. Craig, relax. I, I get it. But <laughs> this is a safe free... space for yeah. your Wolves deep dives. <laughs> when it's free flowing, um, guys that are just average passers might be trying passes they can't make. So mm -hmm. those are a few observations. I, I'll just kind of bounce off that and send it to you, Chris. I, I, I thinking about that question, what excites me most or what I think has been most exciting. I also said, Cat and kind of related to what you were saying, Craig, is like, I like the ball movement that has come off of like cat initiated plays, right? It's the it's the pump and go, and then another defender comes, and I'm seeing Carl like actually just make the straight right-handed pass to the corner and it's swing, swing, and you're getting these good looks for Mike or Ant because right, and we always say the over the head yanking pass or whatever, which is like I think we, we do that to, to a point where we've like degraded the quality of the passer that cat is cat is not a Jokic level passer. I think he tries to do that sometimes. And then in that, when he tries to look like Jokic, it makes it seem like he's overall not a good passer. When in fact, he's probably one of the best passing four or fives 
um, in the league. And I think what I'm seeing in these first three games is like making the simple pass or just, the, and it's not necessarily even simple. It's kind of hard to like get going full speed, slow yourself down, throw a dime to the corner. Like that's not a hard pass, but it's an easier and more efficient, effective pass than, you know, some of the crazy slings uh, that we've seen in the past because yeah, broadly turnovers, broadly ball movement leads to turnovers. Ball movement is good. Turnovers are bad, but they're, they're cousins, right? And the wolves are trying to kind of navigate that balance or that's Finch's style. I think is, is navigating that balance. And I'm really encouraged about what Carl has looked like specific um, to that. What about for you, Chris, what do you think has been exciting from this? I, I kind of shared a, a, I guess I had kind of Craig's eye where I was kind of nitpicking in this game more than sure. I was in the, in the first two. Um, I, I did like how they get into, into stuff early in the offense. They seem to really, uh, Conley seems to be getting them into the, like whatever that initial action is pretty quickly. So I think this mm -hmm. kind of whole structure free flowing thing is working well. I say that with the caveat of the turnovers concern me, yeah. um, you know, that, that first quarter was, was kind of ugly. Um, th the thing that I noticed a couple different times, uh, throughout the, the game when, when Ant, Carl and Rudy were on the floor together, um, we talk a lot about how, you know, Rudy, can clog things up in the lane, especially for Ant, and take away, you know, maybe his ability to drive. And I did notice a couple different times where Rudy was kind of in the dunker spot, kind of around the lane, and Ant just seemed hesitant to drive to the basket, mm. or he pulled up for a mid-range when in other situations he might have taken it all the way to the basket. So it's not as if Ant is like driving and all of a sudden it's getting clogged. I think what happens with Rudy on the floor sometimes is Ant, it takes away his will to want to drive. Right. And I don't think, and I don't think that's completely gone away as mm -hmm. we, as we enter the season. So that that's going to be something I'm going to be watching early on is how often does Anthony Edwards take it all the way to the basket when Rudy Gobert is on the floor? Because mm -hmm. I did notice a couple times in that Knicks game where he just pulled up from 15 feet or, or whatever it was, instead of trying to go all the way to the basket. I, I do think it has been encouraging, though, to see that, you know, Rudy's thinking about that, right? Yeah. Like, I feel like when I'm watching, it is more of that intention of, like, floating in more of that short corner area or whatever because it's like if Ant or Cat, like, start barreling downhill here, like, I can't be here. I think that's on his mind. It's also just going to always be kind of difficult to not be in the way, right? Because yeah. you're this seven-foot-two guy with the seven, eight wingspan or whatever. You're just big. Um, but yeah, I think those are the things that kind of get in theory washed out over the first month or so of the season as they figure out uh, some more of that balance. You have a response to that, Craig? Well, <clears throat> I was just thinking a bigger picture thing as, as Chris says, nitpicking, I totally agree because <laughs> the expectations are so high because part of me says, I don't know if we're going to have the same roster next year. The time is now. And I'm also, I could throw it out to you guys. What does Con, what does Mike Conley have left? What does Rudy have left? They might have three years left. That's great. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this is, I'm putting pressure myself on. We have, we have talent. I think we have a stacked starting five. Uh, we haven't gotten to shake Milton yet, who I love, but <laughs> I, I want, this is the year. And I, I keep saying whenever I look, <clears throat> even with the Vikings or apologize for bringing up the football, but I always look to see who's the best team out there. Can we compete? So I think I know we can compete with Denver. Now, I don't know how close we can get to them, but I sometimes think we can outplay them. So to win a championship, sometimes I'll say, you know, a couple of years ago, it's like, well, you're never going to beat the Warriors anyways, you know. But yeah. this year, I just don't see it. I just don't see the dominant team uh, in the West. So I want to do it now. That put, so that puts more pressure on us to do the right thing, to, to play well immediately. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think that's kind of a interesting proposition of like some, some, a couple of different people asked me on, on Saturday at, at the thing at Fallen Knife. It's like, what, what team in the West do you think the Wolves match up worst with? Which I think is like kind of a way of saying what you're saying, right? Craig, where you're like, well, we know Denver's really good and probably just better than Minnesota, but you don't, you, in that matchup, you don't go like this roster to roster is a bad matchup for this team. If anything, the playoff series last year gives you some confidence that like they can do some funky things with Kat and Gobert on Jokic, like at a minimum there, right? Didn't really seem like they had anybody to guard Ant. 
So it's like kind of removing Denver from from that equation of what team matches do like the Wolves maybe match up poorly within the West. And I was like, I'm gonna need to think about that. And I honestly probably got to think about it a little bit more. But my only real answer was the Lakers in the sense that like for the Wolves to be good this year, right? They need to impose that physicality, impose that size. And I think against most teams in the West, they can, right? Just because they're bigger. The Lakers will match size with this team without really losing a lot of athleticism there either, right? With AD and even even like LeBron, that's that's one of those rare matchups where Jaden is smaller than the guy he's guarding and something like that. So that that's that's the team I'm leading to in the the idea where the wolves maybe match up worst with uh and we'll kind of i guess figure that out over the course of the season but I'm, I'm with you craig where it's not like this thing where there's a warriors team out there like there has been in the past where like eh, kind of no matter what i don't know how that they would ever have Th- that 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 team isn't really isn't really out there you feel you feel that way chris I feel like I feel like Craig is Craig is on this something here because it's something I've thought about and I was even thinking about this this past weekend where this is the time is now for yeah, this man. group like like yeah. and so when I hear like you know the with front this Jaden stuff with this Jaden right. stuff like in the background it kind of turns your head on right. it where you're like yeah like this that's gonna be this a lot is, of money so yep. is, right so when I hear when I hear like you know the, the front office and people say well we, we want to get to the second round i'm like <laughs> no like this is this is your time to really go for it like yeah. you're not going to have anthony edwards and Jaden mcdaniels on rookie scale contracts to where you can surround them yeah. with higher price talent again mm-hmm. this team is going to look much different next season and in future seasons so this the time is now the western conference is open to the point where you can compete with the team that just won the championship and this is the year to do it right no, now i i agree and and it's the idea to to get to shake craig like <laughs> in the future they're probably not going to have the money to be able to like go get a shake milton to be your like ninth man right like that's going to either be higher up in the pecking order or they're going to have no money to spend and for now, to Chris's point, when you have Jaden and Ant on this rookie scale contract, you can re-sign Nikhil Alexander Walker. You can you can sign, you know, Shake Milton. You still have Kyle Anderson and Mike Conley. Down the line, you're probably gonna start losing some of those Mike Conley's, Kyle Andersons as they age out or their contracts expire, and not really have the means to go get a bench player like Shake or Nah. And I think again in these preseason games, we're realizing the value of that, what Nikhil's going to mean to this, and then specifically Shake, we're all seeing him for the first time. But it, it, in theory, right, Craig, like the role that Shake Milton should play, we know is really important because that was supposed to be the Jalen Noel role last year, and Jalen wasn't able to deliver in that role to the degree that they wanted. Yeah, I was a Jalen Noel fan, but I am one of those guys that, quickly will wash my hands and I did it last year of him I was done he didn't come through I never liked his defense he tried he was just one of those guys like Malik Beasley that would guard the guy but the guy would score easily yep totally. but he could he could score uh you know but he couldn't shoot the th- couldn't shoot the three of the wide open threes I think he had one of the yeah. lowest percentages on wide open threes so um I'm excited for shake um I, I think he's solid on defense. He got burned a couple times the other night, but uh, you know he can score. I think he can pass, and um, these are the kind of guys. Like when I used to watch the Wolves back in two thousand four, with you know with Spreewell and and KG and Sam Cassell. I like Trent Hassel a lot. I like these guys that he was a defensive specialist. But you need somebody off the bench to 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 carry the team or help the team, and I think he's I think he's a great addition. Um, the other thing I was going to say is we all say this is the year. That means it's going to be more frustrating with losses. We're going to be, our expectations are high and we're going to be like, this is ridiculous. You know, Mm -hmm. on certain losses, it's going to hurt more than it did last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we are expecting that. Well, how do you lose to this team? Even though, you know, we know the sub 500 problem, but, Mm -hmm. uh, against those teams. So there's a lot of pressure on the wolves and it's going to, it's going to test us. It feels like, to me, it feels like Shake Milton is auditioning to be the starting point guard next year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen with Mike Conley. 
um, after this year. We know they're going to be up against the cap. Like this is, I feel like it's almost a one year audition to see like hmm. how well does Shake Milton fit in and could he potentially be your starting point guard if Mike Conley's not here next year? I don't view, this is my knee jerk. I don't view him mm-hmm. at this point and I haven't seen him play that much. I've looked at his stats. I love his field goal percentage, et cetera, but mm-hmm. I don't view him as a starting point guard, but I could mm-hmm. be wrong. But I, I don't either. I, think, I don't either, but I'm just saying with, with the, the way the roster is going to be constructed next right, year, right. you might, you, you have to try to find value somewhere mm-hmm. and he's already going to be on that contract right. for another year team option. So that it's, could be it's one reasonable. way where they get right. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's reasonable to think that yeah. one of Mike Conley or Kyle Anderson won't be on this team <laughs> next season based on the fact that they're on expiring contracts and the Wolves financial reality. Right. Mm-hmm. And to that, those are two of your point guards in ways, obviously Mike is for sure. And Kyle is kind of too. So if you do remove one of them, the need to varying levels is going to increase to have another ball handler. But I, I don't, Finch approaches the point guard position funny where it's, I think people look at shake Milton. You see, he's like, Oh, six, 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 seven, seven foot wingspan. You don't think of him as a point guard, but I think that's kind of the style of point guard that, that Finch wants to have. I don't think not that he doesn't like his Mike Conley's or his J max, right. To just be the more manager point guard. But I think he's open and comfortable with the idea that, whether it's now or in the or in on the bench this season or in the future, that maybe the future point guard of this team isn't your prototypical point guard point guard, and maybe that's even Ant, right? Like Ant's a possibility um, in in that mix as well. Can I do another the, question. The uh, this oh you the, go first. The great eighties, the great eighties Celtics team did not have a true point guard with Danny Ainge and Dennis Johnson, but but they had the greatest passing forward of all time. <laughs> Nas Reed? Yeah. Yeah, that was, hey, that, that, Nas, that, that is my ever, second question. That's my second question is just Nas Reed. Question will mark. he ever make four three-pointers in a game? <laughs> That's look, pre- look pretty smooth. Why I, not? I, I will say, so again, like particularly the, the first half, I barely watched because the, the we were doing the event thing. So I, I'm re-watching. I did mm-hmm. notice that Nas started like the first – four possessions of the game he fell over which is just the <laughs> the Nas thing that I think everyone knows that I'm a Nas stand believer whatever uh but man that dude falls over all the time and I'm like oh is this maybe going to be Nas look pretty good in those first two games is this going to be the first time where it's a little funky with Nas at the four and then he goes out and makes I think he made five threes right Greg? I, I had it up here yeah yeah, he because I think he hit a he, he hit, hit four he hit he hit, one. four in the first oh, half. Yeah, and then he, and then he, he hit a fifth yeah. one. He was but, four for four at one point. Yeah, I just I just think like it, it's funny, you know, where unfortunately haven't been having Jim Peterson and Michael Grady call these games, so it's NBA TV person X or the MSG. I think on that one, and nobody has any idea how Nas Reed plays basketball is just like, <laughs> like, Oh yeah. Interior force post player. I'm like, what? what are you, like, what are you talking about? Like this is, and then, and then they hit the three and the announcers are like, no way. And I'm like, Nas Reed shoots threes just as often as Carl mm-hmm. Anthony Towns does. That's a actually more. It is just a statistical fact that it's not a flash in the pan. Nas Reed has been in the NBA for four years, shoots a ton of threes he makes like 34% of them. Carl makes like 39, 40% of them. But Nas shoots threes. And I've, I've always kind of, you know, Nas has that little sort of touch shot. I don't view him as like a pure, pure shooter. So I've never, I've never really thought of the idea that he could be like a 40% guy. But I wonder like for this season, right, the best players he's ever had around him, are those looks all really clean? And does this year, is Nas a 38 39 percent three-point shooter i mean chris what would that mean to this team if nas can be that type of offensive floor spacer too huge and and i wonder what that means for the trajectory of the franchise moving forward i was listening to you and kyle go through your your very spicy takes uh the other day and i saw that you had you know that that nas and rudy um might be a, a a really good pairing and in my in the back of my head, I'm thinking like, well, if Nas and Rudy make for a really good pairing, what does that mean for Carl 
moving forward. Or if Nas, Small forward, just if move him my, down. If, <laughs> just move him down. Or if Nas can start shooting closer to 40% from three-point range, I can't help but think, like, mm-hmm. what does that mean for Carl long-term and kind of how they view him? Can Nas then fill in right. as a reasonable facsimile of what Carl can do for a fraction of the cost and that's where that's where my head goes i can't sure. i can't i know listen we've we've belabored carl trade talk and and that's you know been on everybody's mind throughout the summer and will be until they settle this issue next off season but mm-hmm. i can't help but view Nas's development and growth in his game in the lens of what it means for carl anthony towns moving forward especially because of the contract that he's on compared to what carl will be making next year. So uh, if if the more the more Nas Reed improves, the more in the back of my mind I'm thinking like does that mean more and more that they could do without Carl moving forward and that Carl might be an expendable piece? That that's kind of that's literally it, that, that's how I view Nas. Yeah. Nas's growth and development. I I can't separate the two in my mm-hmm. mind. And and we can be kind of there's not a ton of time but there's there's enough time to like the trade deadline is a ways away, right? We got like right. 50 games here before that, that even comes up the next time you would even, the first time you'd even consider making any sort of roster change. Mm-hmm. Like let's see what Carl means for this offense. Another one of my spicy takes, I guess, was that I think this team is going to be better on offense this season than defense when that wasn't Ooh. even close to the case last season. And that would be, that only happens with Carl being Carl plugged back into a better group, the best group he he's ever been yeah. around. So we need to see Carl in this role at the four next to Rudy for an extended period of time next to Ant. And we also see, need to see Nas play the four, which he's done very little of, of in his career too. Like, yeah, I, I said that about Nas and Rudy, but Nas and Rudy have been terrible on the floor together. <laughs> they were terrible on the floor together last season. They were. So we need to see how that plays out before. <clears throat> and, and the point is, is that there's time, I think, before – you need to make any any of those decisions, but it would be naive to not have it on your mind, um, like you said, Chris. Um, what, what what do you think about that, Craig? Well, I I've gone on record saying I like Nas Reed. Everyone else loves him. I like him. I think it's great. My brother loves him, but he loved Eldon Campbell uh, from the Lakers. <laughs> um, Chris Gatling from the Warriors. Chris uh, but Gatling. Um, but. Um, I think he comes off the bench and it's, he's free flowing and he handles the ball. Well, he's quick. He surprises people going to the rim, <clears throat> but I see him do things that I go, you know, he'll make a spin move and throw up an awkward left-handed jump hook or yeah. something. So I don't, I don't think he's as polished as people think he is, but I love him. I want him to be good. Mm-hmm. I think defensively he's okay. You know, he, he helps out and blocks some shots. He could be better on defense. He could be a better rebounder. It's I all do. balanced, man. It really yeah. does. I mean, I know he's joking about the falling over stuff, but like, I know what you're talking about those like little lefty hooks. Yeah, when he sure. misses those. It's because he's not he's off like, balance. It's totally yeah, off he's balance. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. He plays a little yeah. out of control. Mm-hmm. So I like him. Everyone else loves him. I like him. I want him to do well. I love that he attacks all mm-hmm. the time, attacks the rim. He likes that he can handle the ball because he can surprises people. But when you said uh, it would be great if he shot 38 or 39 percent from three i don't think he's capable of that i would take 36 percent in a heartbeat Mm -hmm. because i I think last year he went through a stretch where he couldn't hit a three it was like a few games it was like oh my lord he does the little shrug you know how he shoots a touch shot so it's easy to fall it's easy to get hot like last night or saturday night and it's easy to get cold i think for an extended stretch kind of i also i i couldn't get over the announcers in that game. <laughs> so another question my, my other question i wrote down was what was up with those announcers whatever they called him anthony towns i think they thought his last name is anthony towns it's, it's not um that's i can't i worked with bill pedo from espn so i can't say anything i have to be nice but i i he was fine he just was excited about uh luca looking like wally that was his big thing yeah, yeah. Second half. <laughs> the, the other thing i said i was like okay whatever get over it dean it is getting so common on broadcast that particularly we, we heard this with the team USA stuff all the time. The Jordan comparisons for Ant. I heard Jordan esque multiple times on there. And that is both exciting for Wolves fans, right? Because 
there's an element of it that is like believable. You put some of the side by sides together. You're like, Oh, okay. That looks the same. Um, but Craig, I'm just curious, like what, what do you think of when, when these people are legitimately comparing Anthony Edwards to the arguably the greatest basketball player of all time? Is that excitement or like, Hey you guys, come on. Like 22. I, I take it as uh, physically the way he moves where he can drive and then hang in the air and he's mm -hmm. pretty, and he's smooth. Like he made a jump stop left-handed and he kind of floats a little like Jordan. Mm -hmm. I would prefer if they said Dwayne Wade, yeah. it's less pressure. It's less pressure on Ant. And the thing I, I the thing about Jordan is uh, besides, you know, how athletic he was and, and how uh, competitive he was, his form on his jump shot is better than Ants. It's better than Dwayne Wade. It's better than LeBron James. He had really good form on his jump shot. Yeah. And, um, but uh, I guess it's the athleticism that they, and they sure. don't want to say Dwayne Wade. They just go to Jordan. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess it's, it's, it's neither here nor there. I'm just, particularly when it's not, again, uh, Jim and Grady. I'm I think like, it's more fun to say, Jordan esque. It's fun yeah. to say the ending of Wade Wade-esque. Wade -esque. Yeah. Wade -esque. Yeah. The double the double E of Wade esque doesn't yeah. quite roll off the tongue as easily. Yeah. yeah. Chris, you know what I, I've noticed as a skill development, new skill uh in Ant from from Team USA to even uh, and some of the stuff we've watched now. I let like Ant remember like Ryan Saunders year. Ryan was always hammering Ant. He's like downhill, downhill, force dunk, right? Like because mm -hmm. that was 19 year old Ant, that was his superpower that that people couldn't dunk. What I'm seeing from Ant now is like when he gets downhill with the dribble, like in kind of traffic, right? At like 10 feet from the basket, a crossover, changing the ability to change directions, change hands, get to the Euro step. And he's always kind of had the Euro step, but I'm noticing it like with the dribble in tight space, that opening up like a whole other level of offensive capability around the rim and that change of pace that he's putting in there, I think is going to lead to more fouls. Like if I had an opinion, you know, the, the goal, right. Is Ant getting to the free throw line a lot more. I feel yeah. more confident in the notion that that will happen now than I did when we ended last season by far. I mean, I think he's going to be a force in there, Craig. I, or Chris, sorry. <laughs> Double C's. Yeah, right. Listen, you know me, you know me, man. I'm Craig, normally one guest. Craig, Craig, you, Craig, if you got, if you got go, yeah. you go, I was ready go. coach. I was ready. <laughs> Fire away. I, I, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, he has to. I, I wonder why he doesn't get to the line. I, does, is it because they think he's initiating the contact or what? He did get he's a, big. Could be. Yeah. Big. He, Could he be. Got he's right. He's big. He's, he's, yeah. he's muscular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because these other guys, I don't understand. Like the James Harden and these guys, they get they get to the line all the time. And it's nauseating to watch. <laughs> right. And uh we're not asking for that type of getting to the line, like the slowdown and the Trey right. Young head trip, but the but Ant's just normal force and like a little bit more willingness, I think, at the rim to take the contact rather than try and like glide away from it to shoot it. Like yeah. a little bit more initiation on that. I think I that's mean, a that's, good point. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like he he's not he's not trying to avoid the contact, so therefore Mm -hmm. When contact happens, referees are maybe more. Uh, I think so. Just right? allowing it a little more because yeah. he's not trying to avoid it, and so yeah, I I feel like it, it's similar in a way to like how the wolves have always complained about how cats officiated. It's like you know, cats using his size, his frame to try and not not necessarily bully his way in there, but he doesn't shy away from the contact. He's in some ways, maybe even creating the contact, but a defender is still mm -hmm. impeding his progress to the basket as a result. It's just that he's not trying to avoid it. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I think I see a similar thing with Ant, where the willingness to take on the contact is is higher than the guys that get fouled at a, at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Ant, Ant doesn't really embellish either you know he's he he embellishes audibly with the with yeah. you know hey. he does he, he doesn't embellish uh in terms of his movement though right like he he he, he still plays like he still plays it straight up he's not trying mm -hmm. to flop he's not trying to draw a foul with is cool you know extravagant arm movements or whatever mm -hmm. he just he just yells uh, right. that's his way of trying to draw a foul and refs are not 
Right? We got it. He got As we've seen, refs yeah. do not fall for have not fallen for that for the past year. So the yellow. He's got. He's got to try something else. Clap and he's, and he's got. He's yeah. got. He's also. That was something that reminded me early of last year when he would yeah. get a, when he got a bunch of texts in the first half of the season. Mm -hmm. He he would get up and start clapping at the ref, which is like an easy automatic technical for right. for referees. Like he cut that out in the second half of the season. Mm -hmm. Um, because I thought he was gonna get suspended for getting, you know, yeah. 16 techs or whatever the number is. Right. Um, but then he stopped well short of that. Um, but yeah, he I I, th I really do think it's it's the his just willingness. That's the football player in him a little bit, is the willingness to mm -hmm. absorb the contact and and not necessarily avoid it. Craig, last question. How many wins? does this team have and it's probably related to ant right i mean it's related to everything chris and i were saying there of like how many of those boxes checked it's like you get a couple wins per per those boxes uh where, where do you see him taking this team good question uh i i all i often say when people they want the number of wins i, yeah. I just say i want to finish in the top four but yeah. i don't know what's let's see without being greedy and not knowing how competitive the west is um, 48, that's the, that's, 40, the, that's the hard part, right? It's yeah, like 48, 49. I don't know. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll take that. I'll and take and 40, what do you think that would be the four? Well, I just want to get to the fourth spot and I just can't <laughs> tell, but you, you're a hundred percent right about the Lakers. Cause the people are talking about the Lakers and after the trades last year, I really liked their, yeah. cause I, I, I've always had a lot of respect for Anthony Davis and mm -hmm. Austin Reeves has come into his own. Uh, the siren is in Minneapolis, not in, <laughs> Not in Los Angeles. By the way. I didn't um, get to the mute button in time there. Yeah, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I I'd like close to fifty. I'm just not being greedy by saying fifty. You know, Chris, you haven't written your prediction yet, have you? No, I haven't. Do you, do you have a way you're leaning? I, I haven't. I haven't said. Honestly, that forty nine was my number too. Really? Um, I. I I, I, and I like I, I think the four seed is very reasonable um and I and I've said this uh, I've said this on Rand's podcast and I, to random people that ask me as well is like I think they could be a very good regular season team like I think top four in the west it, it also doesn't equate to being the fourth best team in the west because I, I oh. have a lot of questions about how the various teams are going to make their way through the regular seasons, such mm -hmm. as the Lakers, such as the Warriors, such as the Clippers, such as the Suns, mm -hmm. like with all the, with all the veterans who are injury, injury prone load management days, what have you, how they're just going to approach their various regular season slates. And really in my mind, I think the only, the only two teams that I really like to finish above the wolves are the nuggets and the Kings. Oh, outside yeah. of that, outside of that, I don't like, I don't, I, yeah. I think Memphis because Jaw's not going to be there mm -hmm. for 25 games and Tyus Jones isn't there anymore. Like what's Memphis going to look like? At the well, here's the thing. Season? I mean, we could, we could poke a hole. Stack? Right. We could poke right. a hole in every one of these teams, like Nuggets coming off the championship, Lakers, mm -hmm. LeBron teams never mm -hmm. really hit full bore during the, the season. Grizzlies don't have Ja Morant. Phoenix has the new star team coming together how does that acclimate mm -hmm. to Kawhi and paul george play apparently load management is fake news now or not i i don't really know like there's all these right. these these questions with it which my thought that i've just been kind of honing in on this is just lumping it all together more in the west just yeah. not a big difference from mm -hmm. one or maybe i bet you one team odds are pulls ahead of pulls it ahead. i don't really yeah. know who that yeah. is but like honestly two through eight I wouldn't be surprised if there's not that big of a gap. And I think to Craig's point, like, I think I'm kind of predicting the same thing, which is like in the conversation for the four seed when I say 47 wins, but maybe I'm just condensing the, the West together a little bit more than, than you two are when you say four. I think we're saying the same thing, just viewing the Western conference differently, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I have a couple questions. So Let's go. The, the, the Nuggets lost, uh, what's his name? Bruce Brown, is that his name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was pretty important off the bench. But um, um, I guess my two questions are the, about the Clippers and the Suns. So I still don't understand that the Clippers have a great coach and they have a lot of talent. But for some reason, I and I have friends out here who are Clipper fans and they just kind of 
they're kind of no, they're not. The Clippers are just going to be okay, which doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then I want to know about the Suns because you know I have a lot of respect for Durant. He's older. I have a lot of respect for Devin Booker. Uh, what's his? What's the guy's name? N- N- the center's name? Nurkic. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know his name. I just couldn't remember how to pronounce. I wanted to say mm-hmm. Nerf it, Nerf it or something. <laughs> but anyways, um, who's the point guard? And you know, right. how good are the Suns going to be? Because I they could be really good, regular I, season definitely. Yeah, I, I kind of think they will be, but open question there, right? It, it's kind it, it, weirdly it's sort of related to the Shake Milton thing we were talking about earlier. Like, do you need to be a prototypical? point guard in today's right. game to be effective as the initiator I, I i think that helps to have that option on a team and they don't really have that at all i'd at least like that can they get a second unit point guard so sometimes you have it um but I, i'm generally speaking open to the idea that some combination of beal and booker handling that with katie initiating plenty of possessions himself that that can work. And I know that the major pushback, and I think this is just like overly simplified is like, well, let's look at the last X amount of super teams that have flopped miserably, like the Clippers, like Brooklyn. Um, I, I think so much of that, those failing, particularly Brooklyn had to do with personalities. And while I don't know Devin Booker and Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal, I just feel more confident about those personalities meshing more so than I did about Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm in general, like, I'm a sucker for a bunch of talent in one place. Yeah. And, like, if I think you have a good coach, which I think Phoenix does. Oh, he's uh, great. Vogel, he's like, great. I, I don't know. I mean, they might ultimately be my one seed uh, pr- prediction in the Western Conference. But, again, holes to be poked in that, too. Yeah, I mean, it's a that's where I'm at. Completely new team. Completely new team. I just – I just don't know. Right. And that's why I say four seed for the Wolves and Denver, Sacramento, and then one other team finishes ahead of them. Mm-hmm. Four seed feels reasonable to me. Yeah. Why are you guys avoiding the most talented young team in the West, the OKC Thunder? <laughs> Listen, they're going to be a lot of fun as usual. Um, <laughs> I, who knows? Who knows? I, 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 just how much of a step are they going to make this year? Are they going to make a huge step, a small step? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. You know. How good people, is Chet? How good is Chet? How healthy can he be? Um, people yeah. always ask me, Craig, who did you play like? Well, I was a, I was a more of a pure shooter, but I played just like Josh Giddy. That's who I played. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think there'll be I, to, and I actually just like have enjoyed following the Thunder. I think they're a cool story. But I, I think with both Oklahoma City and Sacramento, they kind of out kicked their coverage a little bit last season. And maybe that doesn't like totally pop with the Thunder, who won only 40 games. But like I, baking in another like eight, seven, eight wins for them seems a little excessive to me when I think that maybe they weren't a 40 win. Like the Wolves, when the Wolves, two years ago, when the Wolves won 46 games, I don't think they were a 46 win team, the Pat Bev year. Like, I think that was like, I always said, I think that was like a 42, 43 win team. I think that's kind of like what the Thunder were last year. And I think to some extent, that's what the Kings were also. And the main reason there being they got, they were very healthy. And that maybe misrepresented them a little bit though. You know, we don't know. And that's why it's fun. And I'm just excited that the West is, is packed like this and that we can't have a strong opinion, Craig. Um, the, just to let you know, and you maybe you realize this, but the national media and the friends that I know, they just, as we are talking about the Wolves locally, hopefully finishing in the top four, they keep saying nationally, oh, playing, they're going to fight for the playing again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I just wanted to say, as we don't want that, but the last two years the get, were the most exciting games, the home game with the Clippers, yeah. <laughs> when they took Cat out of the game and D'Lo went off and Ant played well. And then the OKC game was like so cathartic. So it, Beat it's, their fun, ass. Yeah. it's fun basketball for the fans, but it would be more fun, obviously, if we finish <laughs> in the top four. Chris, wrap it up with uh, – with your with your Fraser question. Oh yeah, uh, you know, in honor of of Craig's questions on his podcast, uh, top five Fraser episodes. Well, boy, I don't know if I can do it, but I'll just off the yeah. top of my head, yeah, and yeah, you'll yeah. probably know the names of them or what or what they call mm-hmm. them or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, 
I tried to think of the ones I showed my brother. Um, um, this was not a top five, but this is a funny one. Do you remember when they took the class from the guy about the motor, about the, the shop, engine? the shop class? Yeah. 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 And yep, we're yep, here yep. early and we're sitting early and we're already here and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I love that one. That's, that, that's not my favorite, but that was one of them. Set, I forget what that was called. That's in season nine though. I know that for yeah. sure. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I always like the ones there. There, it turns out to be like a British farce where they're, they're at the the condo, um, and um, but they had gone to uh, they'd gone to the opera and they came back and and then Frazier, the guy, what, what's the, 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 the it was Marg Helgenberger. Yes, wasn't? yes. Okay, this what, is called this is called the um, out with Dad. It's called. It's from yeah. season seven, written by Joe Keenan, who wrote a lot of my favorite. Yeah. Fraser episodes and Martin has to pretend that he's gay because he let down Fraser's date's mother by saying right. that he was gay. Yes. Right. Yes. So yeah. when they do that stuff and, mm -hmm. and I, I love it, this one is also a little like that. It's, it's when the, uh, the old boyfriend of Daphne who was an underachiever comes over and now he's, he's done very well and they're playing a game and you know, Roz and and uh, Daphne go after each other. Um, yep. And I, I I so I enjoy the ones where it's also also, also a Joe Keenan written episode. That's the season four premiere you're talking about. That one. That's on my list of I top. Hope Dane is episodes. enjoying this. I hope. I, I'm, 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 I'm I think I think I think that's called. Oh, uh, what's that one? I think it's called the Two Mrs. Cranes or something like that. I think that's that episode title. Um, there was one I showed. Uh, my brother and, and the family, and I just don't remember, but it was um, when um, Babe uh, uh, Babe Newworth came back. She was wearing the mini dress, and she came out to Seattle, and they and she was in the uh, the condo. I just don't remember. Uh, uh, she, was it was it when she slept with Niles? I don't think it's that one. It no, wasn't it's that, that one? one. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, but but I can't remember what happened. I just remember I said you got to see this. But you know she she had a funny line where she's I thought I'd go I you know her hair playful. I chose playful. I something. chose playful to me. <laughs> yeah yeah. But um, uh, yeah I'm I'm forgetting some. Can you give me give me a couple that I'm you, really you you, you you hit you hit a, a bunch of mine like uh, that one's literally I think that one you're talking about is literally called the show where Lilith comes back. It's from okay. the, it's from season one. Okay. Um, the the out with dad from season seven is is a favorite of mine. The two Mrs. Cranes also a favorite. There there's one from the last. There's a couple from the last season that actually I think are just fantastic episodes. Their last season to me was one of their best. Um, the one where Patrick Stewart comes back and plays, oh, yeah. uh, comes in yeah. and plays a an opera director. Oh, and yeah. and he oh, tries yeah. to date Frazier because yeah yeah through through a series of misunderstandings. Frazier is like accidentally outed on this radio show. Yes. Wait, and, wait, yeah, wait, wait. Yeah. That's not the one where he's wearing the tight tennis shorts. It is the one where he's wearing okay. the tight tennis shorts. That yeah. one is unbelievable, but I thought it peaked <laughs> when he was down in the gay bar and they <laughs> take me home when Niles is yelling, take I'm me home. I'm begging with you, please take me home. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> that that one is really good. That's the, the um, doctor is out. That one. Oh, out. I should say when I fell in love, I, I loved how they dragged out the whole Daphne Niles thing. Mm -hmm. I, I can watch that stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. But when she danced and put her leg over his shoulder when they were at the ball together uh the charity dance. Event, that, yeah. that was that was pretty amazing that's a that's season three moon dance that one's called they won a writing emmy for that episode oh yeah moon that dance that's right moon dance it's called yeah. yep yep that was that's that's what the the emotional touches of that episode are are so are just so brilliant and david hyde pierce was just so heartbreaking in that episode I, yeah I, it's one of my favorite performances from him yeah um and another favorite performance of mine, an episode that stands out. Um, Ham radio is, is like the fan consensus uh, <laughs> favorite episode. Frazier puts on you know, for Dane and the audience that the Frazier puts on a radio, a radio drama yes. at uh, KACL, like an yeah. old time mystery radio drama. And it just goes haywire oh, yeah. when, when they, when they actually do it live on the air. Um, it, it, it there's helium balloons involved and Niles yes. changing his voice and playing multiple characters and yeah. getting pissed at Frazier for how he's directing it. It's just, it's just the, probably the all time classic Frazier episode. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, that's that that's high on my list. But the other one, the other David Hyde Pierce, uh, like if, if I could sum up David Hyde Pierce in you know an eight minute segment, which is what this was, the two Valentine or the three Valentines episode from season six, where the episode is broken up into three acts. Um, one is uh, Frazier has a date uh, and uh, Daphne and Martin are like out on Valentine's day, like talking about their relationship. But eight, the first eight minutes of the episode is David Hyde Pierce basically doing silent physical comedy in Frazier's apartment yeah. as he's getting ready for a date. Yeah. And, and the, the apartment catches on fire. Yeah. <laughs> I remember on that. Fire yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything. And it's just, that is David Hyde Pierce, like at his, at yep. his best, like yep. just all, almost all physical comedy, just awesome writing, awesome directing and just a hell of a performance, like just amazing. Can I interject one thing in here? <laughs> because because I, I'm thinking about this from the listener standpoint, yeah. who I know this about Chris is he is, his brain is like a Excel spreadsheet of like pop culture. And I don't know if you know this skill that Chris has, oh, no. Craig, but, but oh, we're gonna no. put him on the spot here. No, Can not pick, this. Yes. Not this. Can you pick a date, Craig? Any date, like month, the date, the year, in the last what twenty five years, Chris? About twenty five years, yeah. Pick pick any date. That that's the only preamble I'm giving you. <clears throat> Sounds like I'm talking to Jerry Lucas here. I don't. Know. <laughs> do you know that? Do you know that that is he? Jerry Lucas played for the Knicks. I was going to say the old, he coached for a while too, right? I don't or remember him coach? coaching, but he was uh, he was he played at Ohio State. He played for the Knicks, but he could memorize the phone book. He had this memory where mm. he memorized the new the New Chris York isn't City. Quite that level, okay, of this, but it, it's this is this one this is close. So just give me a date. Um, give me a date. So I am going to say November twenty fourth. Uh. 2006 okay and what chris's skill is is you can give him any date and he will tell you what the number one song in america oh. was on the billboard hot 100 so the date was november 24th 2006 i'm gonna look it up here chris i will give you time to think about that's an unbelievable answer. oh my I goodness all right, so this, so my, my mind goes through like where was I in time at that particular moment and what was yep. popular. So that would have been my sophomore year of college. So what was popular in the fall of 2006? And that was about the time when like Akon was like really hitting it big. I think Beyonce had Irreplaceable out, but I think that was a little later. Um, Justin Timberlake had also put out his huge album. So it's like, it's going to be one of those guys, one of those people, I think. And I'm going to say, I'm going to go with Justin Timberlake. I'm going to go with Justin Timberlake, my love as the, as the, as the song. Ladies and gentlemen, the correct answer is Justin Timberlake, my love featuring <laughs> Whoa. <T> <laughs> Obviously, we didn't. We didn't We're set that up. This. We gave we gave Chris or we gave Craig the uh, opportunity to. So how does that work? It. I just googled it, and it says November twenty sixth, November twenty sixth, two thousand and six. Number one song is "I Want to Love You," Akon, but maybe it's okay. a different chart. It could be a different chart. Yeah, you gotta. You just have to make sure you're on the Hot One Hundred and not like oh, okay. the, the pop radio chart or the mainstream right. top right. forty on, chart. Yeah, I'm yeah. on Billboard.com. You're on okay. you're on the Hot 100. Yeah, yeah but, they, yeah. but oh. Billboard has a number of different charts, and depending on which one. Right. If we would have got the answer wrong, and we would if that that would have been the actual <laughs> answer, we would have given him credit there. Too. So they, that's amazing. They, they, that they, is amazing. Love you was also like circling so, the top spot at that time too. The, the, yeah. the problem yeah. is yeah. when I when I uh, at some age in my 30s. I stopped listening to top 40 and it, I didn't listen to, I know it was in the nineties. I, I listened to music in the eighties, all that stuff, all the British, you know, new order and psych furs and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Kate, I loved Kate Bush running up that hill years ago. Yeah. Uh, but then I stopped listening to the top, uh, the, the top 40 and someone said, you know, uh, 
Boys to Men has the number one song in America. <laughs> and I had never and I had never heard it. And I go, I'm I'm done with top 40 music. Yeah. I'm done. So in the 90s, I didn't listen to any of that stuff in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> Boys to Men was inescapable for me growing up in the in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh yeah, they set the they set the record with my girl Mariah, 16 weeks. Yeah. And number one until Old Town Road came along. And so I don't. It. I know you're a big Mariah fan, and I know she has a, a booming voice, <laughs> but I don't really listen to her except um, one of her songs is just tremendous, and I listen to it because I I love it. But um, what's I want to ask you if it's one of her biggest songs? But sure. um, um, I'm just trying to remember the name of it here. <laughs> you know, B Bobby Womack's on the radio. What's oh, that? we be we belong. We belong together. together. Is yeah. that is that one of her top songs? It was. Yeah, it was her big comeback song in 2005. Like her career had hit a little a little lull from the whole yeah. glitter fiasco, yeah. and that song that song was number one for 14 weeks in the summer of 2005. It's it's still one of the longest running number one hits yeah. of all time, and that was like her huge comeback song. Like put Great it back song. on the map. Yeah her album that year was the biggest selling album of the year. Like that was, that was the, that was a song that single-handedly rejuvenated her career okay. like for, for this little later peak. Absolutely. Have you guys ever heard of a song called Georgie Porgy by Toto? Mm -mm. Okay. That I have not heard. Maybe <laughs> it's funny. It, it's one of those things where I could care less about Toto, but Georgie Porgy has a little bit of it, the way it's written is a little different. And, um, um, I heard it a few years ago uh, in uh, I was in the desert and they have a lot of live music out in the Palm Springs area. And this, this guy played Georgie Porgy uh, Toto. And uh, I just, I couldn't believe it. So now it's, it's, you know, songs from your childhood that are really good. You know, I, I think you might know one of my, I, I listen to Miles Davis. I listen to Bill Evans. I like my jazz. I, I listened to soul music growing up. I didn't listen to white rock and roll, but um I have a uh, a guilty pleasure, some songs. And the funniest one is this one hit wonder, cheesy, but I would get me psyched before I played basketball. I'd listen to Barry White, Let the Music Play, and I'd listen to this called Into the Night by Benny Mardonis. Oh, I know this song. <laughs> <laughs> is that, you know how he just leaves I know that the song. floor at Yeah, the end? absolutely. Yeah. Just yeah. like he lets it all out. That's yeah. A, yeah. That's, a, that's, a fantastic, that's a fantastic song. That's... Now I average 26 a game at Hastings. <laughs> <laughs> Into the night. <laughs> Fueled uh, by that, into the night. That's such a that's such a, that's such a, a quintessential song of that time. Like yeah, I think I think yeah. of all the, I think of the production and the synths and like and yeah. like yeah, that's 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 very of its time. But have it's you ever awesome. seen that? Have you ever seen that thing on YouTube where those two people, this this guy and this girl, uh, listen to a song for the first time, an old song from the first time. Yep. Like yep. they I listen to Wild. I, I, I watch. I watch the. I watch those videos a lot. Like yeah. those reaction videos to older music. Yeah, yeah. They go. This is not. Oh, this is Wild Cherry. Play that funky music. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced they have heard these songs before. And they're like they scripted what? out their reactions. You think it's to, scripted? I think it's scripted. <laughs> I think it's scripted. It reminds me of like one of my favorite little Wolves videos. They do. Remember when Andrew Wiggins listened to Michael Bolton? Yes. Yeah, 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 hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> That's pretty good. Dude. Is that what he said? He goes, yeah, that was pretty, pretty good. good. That was yeah. pretty good. He was like lost in a trance for five uh, seconds. Yeah. That was so uh, great. That was funny. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Uh, this was awesome. Craig, appreciate you uh you popping on here. Thank you, well, Craig. next time we'll have we'll, we'll choose a random year and a random position on the roster and see if you can pick out like <laughs> the backup small forward in 1994. That's probably Oh, save it, save it, save it, save it. Uh, Craig, do you want to uh, let people know where they can uh, find your podcast? The Life Gorgeous on YouTube uh, and every Apple, Spotify, everywhere. I heart the Life Gorgeous podcast. And I really enjoy my Instagram. I actually have more fun on my Instagram than anything. But uh, Mr. Craig Kilborn on Instagram. Awesome. Um, and, and Chris, you were actually featured in an article on The Ringer. Uh, or a quote in, in there about this this <laughs> new uh, yeah. yeah about your Fraser fandom and how that I, I thought it was cool just like because I have an idea of what your like life looks like on the road traveling and how mm -hmm. you kind of talked about Fraser being your all right I'm back from the game at midnight or whatever mm -hmm. and I have a flight at six in the morning and that's like 
I, I know that feeling, like that anxiety. Eases, eases my anxiety. Oh, I, yeah, cause exactly, I, I told, yeah, particularly yeah, if I'm on the road yeah. and I have like a flight the next morning, I'm, mm -hmm. I like do not trust myself that my alarm, <laughs> like I put it across the hotel room. Yeah. You need a little Frasier to, uh, to, to calm to you down and, and unwind. Yep. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll try that out this year. But anyways, uh, what, what was the name of the article on the ringer? Sorry. Um, it had to do with people. I forget the, the headline of it, but it had to do with people that fall asleep watching the show Frasier. Um, oh. so if you just kind of <laughs> Google that, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then and go to the Star Tribune, StarTribune.com. Please subscribe, everybody. Absolutely. I want to keep traveling. <laughs> so yes. <please> yes. Subscribe. <laughs> and you'll and you'll be on the uh, you'll be on the road here soon with yes. uh, starting in Toronto. Yep. It's like a, a week away almost. A week and a half so. away. Yeah. I can't we'll believe be I can't believe is the home opener Jimmy Butler. It yeah. is unreal. Yep. You're gonna get out here? Not for that, but I I'll be watching. I don't I don't like Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean we gotta laugh at the media day stuff though. The hair like oh, that, that's I just don't I don't know. I don't know if it's like laugh mm -hmm. with or at or just be like that's an interesting dude. I, I appreciate Jimmy's place in the, the chris the pop culture of the nba like yeah jimmy has he been, occupies a unique space for sure yes yeah. yes yeah. and yeah unfortunately <laughs> did what he did to the wolves but uh a unique character and mm -hmm. uh it'll be that will be a very a very fun game for the home mm -hmm. opener um he's craig kilborn he's chris hine thank you guys uh for doing this I will talk to you both soon. Chris, I'll see you at practice in a little bit. And Craig, I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. Uh, until next time, he's Craig, he's Chris, I'm Dane.